All right, so good evening and or good afternoon, everyone. It depends on where you are. So we are going to start, yes, this uh, launch event of the book, uh, our book called English for Academic Purposes, Reflections, Description and Pedagogy, and uh, which was organized by me, right? By Rosani, I Rosani, and by Marini. Uh, so, first of all, we'd like to thank the authors who have contributed to this collection. And, uh, well, it's this is a work of uh, two years, almost two years, so it's been quite a journey. And without the help and the patience of everyone, uh, we wouldn't be here. Uh, the authors represented here are not here by chance, okay, directly or indirectly. Uh, they are researchers that somehow connect the graduate program in linguistics and literature at URGIS. Uh, to the audience, we'd like uh, also to thank you for being here with us. And at the end of the presentations, we'll have a Q&A question. So uh, uh, feel free to share your comments and questions here on YouTube. Uh, this is going just to be an informal conversation, okay? and. Um, we start just like saying that uh, the idea uh, that we had about publishing a book on the AP started because this has been a very like fruitful area over the years, in, especially in the last few years, and especially in Brazil in the last few years, uh, both in terms of research and teaching. And we believe that many different scholars around the world have interesting things to share. Uh, so the book starts with four chapters uh, which use corpus linguistics um, uh, you know as the methodology from the state of the art to teaching implications and a report on the compilation of a learner corpus and then uh, it moves to chapters that bring research results and a review of useful thing uh, tools to teach collocations and Last but not least, the book closes with a chapter about EMI in the context of Brazilian universities. So I will now call uh, Daisy uh, to start talking about her chapter. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you, Simone. And I would like to thank also Rosane and Marini for the invitation to um, submit a chapter to this book. Um, the chapter I'll talk briefly about was written by myself and Tony Bedrissad Jr., who is unable to be here with us today, uh, but he also thanks the organizers. And um, so our chapter, um, as Simone was saying, right, we, we are somehow related to, to the, the program at UGIS. I'm not from UGIS, I'm from FMG, and Tony is from PUC São Paulo, but we are um, involved in several projects, and that's important to say that we have been funded by PAPEMIG, um, CNPK, CAPES, and PAPESP uh, in the last few years. And so some of the uh, issues that we brought up in the book chapter come also from our work and from our uh, studies uh, in the work we do with the uh, corpus linguistics and uh, English for academic purposes. So our chapter starts with a, a brief introduction, bringing all the way like, so what is important in EAP and how corpus linguistics has contributed to it, right? So starting from uh, the influence of um, uh, lists, right? Like West in the 1953, and then how academic formula lists came up uh, in the in 2000 uh, work of uh, Cox had and how important it was because it was then based on corpus, right? And disciplinary corporate that she put together. Um, but one thing that um, moved on from that kind of work, right? The kinds of lists that teachers could use, EAP English as uh, an academic purpose teachers could use, we moved on to other types of lists that brought in a great contribution from corpus linguistics uh, in the way, uh, in the sense that the focus was not anymore on individual words, but on 
um, phrases, right? On lexical bundles or uh, phrases in a way. So this is an influence, a very uh, important contribution uh, from corpus linguistics into EAP, right? And then there's a section, a uh, very detailed section, on lots of studies um, in the connection between vocabulary, teaching and learning, and uh, the contribution of corpus linguistics. Um, Simone, just let me know if I'm talking too fast because I'm a bit worried with time. <laughs> um, no, it's okay. Okay. And then the other section that we presented focuses on grammar, right? But then we chose to talk about grammatical complexity because uh, it has been brought from corpus linguistics. Um, lots of studies, especially by Fiber and his associates, um, they have focused on grammatical complexity, and this can this has also been a great contribution to EAP. So, what it means, right? So, grammatical complexity can be interpreted in many different ways, right? But um, after a study that Viber and his associates um, ran in 2011. Um, they proposed uh, different measures for grammatical complexity. So, so for a long time, it was um, based on T units, a lot, a lot of insubordination, and people would talk about how writing was difficult because of the complexity of writing, and it was very much associated with uh, subordination, right? So students were able to do that. Then they found out in their studies that a lot of the complexity, if we compare regs right, like conversation in academic registers, like articles, uh, we notice that um, the distinction is not really that the complexity is not uh, on the academic side, is not on the clausal level, but on the phrasal level, right? And actually conversation is much more uh, it has lots of clauses embedded. So there is also some kind of complexity in conversation, but it's a, of a different nature. So this has changed the paradigm, right? And, um, and so then I am the understanding of uh, how um, academic writing is so dense, right? And then that it, it reflects on the size of the noun phrases, for instance, or together with the use of prepositional phrases. And so this has been very much uh, studied. And, and this has been a, a great contribution because then we can compare different disciplines and how they use um, compl grammatical complexity to pack the information, right? And especially um, to to be able to be quite, they are able to be quite dense. So academic texts are quite dense, bringing in a lot of information because it's all um, grounded really uh, in, in the phrases rather than in the clauses, right? Um, so there are several studies that have gone through this, uh, including uh, one of my groups in which, one of my research group in which we compare um, chemistry research articles to applied linguistic articles and we found out our hypothesis first was that oh, okay the applied linguistics articles probably won't have such long NPs as in the chemistry articles and we were wrong right so we were able to find um especially the NPs that um had adjectives which was our focus then um a paper we published in 2020 um, we were able to find that applied linguists also use quite long noun phrases like six, seven, um, not eight, but we were able to find as long as with the eight words in chemistry. But what we realized and we were able to identify is that maybe the, not maybe, but the relationship between the parts, the elements of the, the noun phrases I may not always be with the head now. So the understanding of the relationship between the elements of a noun phrase can be quite complex. And then in the chemistry uh, cases, they seem to be sometimes related to different elements. So things like that can bring in once uh, an AP teacher um, decide is able to have um, a corpus 
of the discipline that uh, with the students they're working with, they're able to detect those things. So then can can make it easier for uh, for them to understand what's going on in those articles and also to produce such articles. Right. Um, I think I'm moving on to the last part because of my time. And the, the last part focuses on the multidimensional analysis and its contributions to English uh, to EAP as well. Right, so in the sense that the multi-dimensional analysis is um, an analysis that works with the comparison of registers and the co-occurrence of elements of linguistic features uh, that uh, together they are able to um, convey and communicate specific uh, meanings, right? So it has a, a specific communicative purpose that some, um, some grammatical features occur together. So for instance, in, in an academic text, we might, we may have lots of uh, passive voice, long words, or a high um, frequency of nouns, right? And so they come together because they are used together because of the what we usually want to convey, right? Lots of information, uh, maybe very many tech, technical terms and things like that. So. Um, because the multidimensional analysis is able to do a very detailed description of specific registers, right? Or even specific types of texts uh, in the academic register, because it's our focus, the focus of this book here is on academic um, text, right? Academic language, right? Um, then we are able to inform teachers better, right? And they can use. Uh, that kind of information to prepare their materials um, in, or to improve um, the kind of feedback that they give to their students. Simone, I think that's it. I just want to uh, leave some time for my colleagues. <laughs> Thank you very much again for the possibility of uh, being uh, working together with you guys on this uh, extremely interesting and important book. Thank you very much, Daisy. And I really re like recommend this chapter for a very like um, uh, detailed uh, introduction to multidimensional uh, analysis. Yeah, it's a good chapter for that. Okay. Uh, so now uh, it's Anna Bocorni, mm -hmm. our colleague. Okay. Yes. Uh huh. So yes, like uh, days. I'd like to thank Simone and Marini, yeah, for the invitation. Um, and I'd like to say that well, the, the title of our chapter is from specialized corpus to the EAP classroom: integrating authentic data into materials design, in a reference to Anno Kiff's book. And our chapter was written by myself, by Ana Freitas from UFXPA and by Rosalie Hebeck, who is here. <laughs> so the three of us worked uh, in this chapter. And actually, inspiration for the chapter came from like, um, uh, like during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we had to work with a group of um, EAP teachers, uh, pre-service, but who were teaching in our writing center at Urgis. And, um, um, you know, during these sessions that happened online, yeah, um, teachers uh, would always, um, one of the, uh, their tasks would be to design materials and they would always resist using corpus linguistics. So um, then we thought that maybe it would be interesting if we could organize um, something that could help them something like a, a manual um, that would make it easier for them to, to actually use uh, corpus data to inform the design of their materials. Um, and then we start the chapter by saying that almost two dec dec uh, decades ago, Sinclair, 2004, uh, anticipated that corpus-based language teaching would revolutionize language pedagogy. And then that in 2024, 20, 21, 22, this uh, was not happening, yeah, in our context. So uh, I must say that again, 
all the inspiration that we got was from this experience uh, we are having with our um, teachers, EAP teachers. So uh, we started with a review, you know, and as we moved on, we we thought about having like principles that would import would be important for the teachers to refer to when designing materials. And and again, in our case, EAP materials, right? Um, and one of these principles, right, that we suggest uh, was to use um, uh, language data extracted from corpora. Uh, after that, we um, started suggesting ways they could extract this data from corpora, right? And uh, in special, we focused in, in three tools that they could use. So Sketch Engine, Lanxbox, and uh, Ant Family, and Corgen, and and Conk. Um, and because we knew that, uh, again, it would be hard for them to, to deal with these tools, we wrote sort of procedures, <laughs> like a manual, you know. So number one, do this, number two, do that, da, da, da. And then we extracted uh, data and suggested ways uh, that they could incorporate this data into their, their materials. So one of the things um, we, we decided to include was uh, the CQL, the Corpus Query Language that is um, part of Sketch Engine. Um, and um, it was very interesting to see that um, this is, is done in the book and we use the book, the, the chapter, yeah, with the, the teachers, the AP teachers, um, that once they, they get to know the, the, um, the resource, they end up by using it and, and it's amazing that they use uh, in a way that we wouldn't imagine, you know, so that's very nice what happened um, after we started using the chapter with our uh, teachers in this in this context, right? Um, what else can I say? We also um, started using or showed in the book Lanxbox, especially the this, the feature that Lanxbox has for um, extracting um, specific language elements, like for example passive voice. So this was also um, included in the chapter. Um, and I guess that's pretty much what we did, right? Um, let me see if I have anything else. Yes, it's pretty much um, the objective of the, of the book. So I was very happy um, and I'd like to thank our flat teachers because they inspired, you know, us uh, to to have that text produced, you know, and, and based on their needs, the text was, uh, came up, you know, and I hope it can help other EAP teachers as well. Okay, that's it. So thank you, Simone, again, and thank you, Marini. Thank you very much, Ana, for presenting our paper, our chapter. Thanks a lot. Uh, now I'd like to invite Paula, who's here representing also Luciano, Talita, and Viva, talking about the, the chapter Do It Yourself Corpora to Support Shape and STEM Research Paper Writing. Thank you very much, Paula. So um, I also would like to thank you, Rosane, Simone, and Marini for the invitation. Um, I have been working in partnership with you guys uh, since the workshops, academic workshops that we had at the Sao Paulo State University, UNESP, and uh, URGIS, and uh, the University of Surrey. So we had this project that started in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, or 18. 
and we uh, offered some workshops to researchers from different areas uh, in which they got in contact with uh, corpus linguistics and different corpora in order to write their own research papers. So since then, we have been working on that project in, in different ways. So um, here at UNESP, I have worked with Luciano Franco da Silva, Talita Serpa, and Diva Cardoso de Camargo. And we offered, we have been offering every year a course called Academic Writing and Corpora, in which we um, continued the work that we started with the British Council support in 2019. Um, so our chapter is called Do It Yourself Corpora to Support Shape and STEM Research Paper Writing. And um, first of all, we review, we, we have a review of academic te texts and papers that dis, uh, discuss academic writing and corpora. Then we discuss the use of formulaic language and its contributions to language studies. And after that, we, you, we offer a practical way to compile a corpus in different areas using AntCorgen, which is a tool that will withdraw uh, research papers from PLOS, which is a platform of research papers. So the, the researcher can choose the area that he would like to have in his own collection of corpus. So if he works with math, he will choose, he will be able to choose a uh, text from math. If he works with arts, he will also be able to choose only text with arts, which will be quickly withdrawn by uh, PLOS. And we compare the use of language in shape disciplines, which stand for social sciences, humanities, arts, uh, for people and economy, to STEM areas, which are uh, areas of science that involve science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So uh, we teach the researcher how to um, quickly see which are the most frequent words, adjectives, terms, nouns used in their own area. And based on that, he will be able to read excerpts of different research papers in his own area. After that, he will be able to, um, to write his own research paper by getting to know the language that is mostly used by his peers in other countries. So I think um, that's basically what we do in this, um, in this chapter. And um, yeah, and that's it. So I would like to thank you all for the invitation again in my name and in the name of my colleagues who wrote this chapter with me. Thank you so much. All right, so thank you, Paula, for sharing with us your chapter. And now it's time for Greta. Greta, it's up to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, to the editors for including um, our chapter in the book and giving us an opportunity to share um, this kind of work. Um, as you will see, it's a little bit um, different. Uh, my name is Greta Paris, and I'm one of the um, uh, co-authors. Um, as I will talk later, this chapter was the outcome of an international collaboration. So the six of us, some of us in Canada and with Marini and Simone um, in Brazil. Uh, the title of our chapter is Creating a Local Learner Corpus, Insights on Project Design and Data Analysis from the Pilot Phase. A bit of a long um, title, but um, really what um, we were trying to do, uh, we were trying to uh, figure out a way 
to build a learner corpus of student writing in an EAP program uh, for teaching and research applications. So we, we, we followed um, how we moved to the design um, of, of this uh, corpus. So the project started in 2019, um, uh, initiated at Vantage College by Sandra. Uh, Vantage College is an EAP program with a coordinated curriculum that includes content-focused and language-focused uh, credit-bearing courses. And the curriculum is informed by systemic functional linguistics. And you will see through the chapter that um, we draw on uh, systemic functional linguistics for coding, uh, some of the project data as we look at genres, uh, as well as for the last part uh, where my colleague Alfredo carried out an analysis. Um, we named the project Vancor. Um, as I said, it's a pilot. Uh, project um, and we plan to scale it up. Um, uh, part of it, um, essentially you'll find um, this chapter very valuable, very useful if you're thinking of starting a small collection, a small uh, learner corpus. This chapter is an excellent resource um, as we believe it really fills a gap in this um, area. It provides insights into design or the process that we followed as well as um, some of the relationships that we were building, the community of practice that, that we build. Um, and um, we also provide a, a short analysis of a small uh, part of the corpus. So in terms of the process, uh, the design, putting together the small learner corpus, um, I'm just going to signal for you, for example, you can see a timeline uh, where we identified um, four key stages. Um, in terms of uh, the relationships we built and maintain, uh, this is an important part of the chapter and a very part, important part of, of building uh, the corpus. Um, we we collaborated with many learner corpora experts uh, some in our team like simone and outside uh, they were extremely valuable um, and it was truly a, a community of practice um, you can see this already from the list of six co-authors um, of the of the chapter um, to illustrate the benefits to teaching and research in our context, my colleague Alfredo Ferreira um, conducted an SFL informed analysis of a small sample um, of assignments. So um, he examined, for example, the students' use of comparative language in chemistry reports. Um, he identified this area of this course as, as a challenge for the students. Um, and Alfredo reports uh, on this analysis, uh, informed also by SFL. And um, he also reports how he was able to go back and make revisions to the curriculum and to the assignments. Um, so this project, um, we believe, is very valuable um, and, and very much um, uh, relevant in the context, the EAP context we were in. And the hope is that the instructors in the program um, uh, go back to this corpus and can use it for, for teaching and um, uh, research purposes. Um, so this is our chapter, uh, just trying a pilot, um, uh, really going through the development phase and uh, just pointing out to everybody who was involved um, how we adjusted the project along the way as we started with some ideas and then as we found our own for example technical limitations as we came across institutional constraints how we had to change our course um, to finally gather the data and and put it all together and uh, then for alfredo to do the analysis so i hope you enjoyed the chapter and uh thank you very much um for, for having me Thank you very much, Greta. And it was indeed, uh, you know, very a very fruitful project. Uh, yeah, as you said, the community of practice that emerged from uh, our collaboration. And I miss those days. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, now I'll call Daisy Amaral to talk about her chapter. 
Hi, I'm uh, the other Daisy Amaral. Then. So <laughs> I would like to first to thank um, Marini and uh, Simone and Rosani for the opportunity to be part of this project. And uh, also Larissa and Marini for writing the chapter with me. Um, so uh, the title of our chapter is um, but before that, the, this chapter started as um, an idea for a, a final paper of a PhD module that we did, me and Marini, with uh, Simone in 2019, I guess. And then it was developed. Um, so the, our title is The Role of uh, Genre in Academic Language Use, the Case of Critiques and Case Studies in Bo or Bali. Um, we had the objective then um, to analyze uh, the use of lexicogrammatical complexity features in two genres of university student texts written at the same level. And we wanted to describe the linguistic uh, characteristics of these two genres. We chose uh, two genres from uh, Bo that had uh, distinct communicative purposes, critiques that focus on uh, um, showing the ability to evaluate an object of study and case studies that are written to in Bo to prepare for student uh, professional practice and they are more focused on describing an object of study. We then selected 95 case studies and 83 critiques written for by uh, first year of MA students uh, from the four disciplinary groups of Bo and the texts were tagged by the Biber tagger and we extracted then the frequencies of language features. Uh, we had selected previously 23 features based on the literature of uh, language complexity, uh, academic language and university writing. So we compared each one of the features between the two genres. And the results then um, show that most of the linguistic features analyzed appeared with the higher frequencies in critiques. Uh, half of them didn't have um, statistically significant differences. And the same features were used in both, but uh, in both genres, but sometimes with different communicative purposes. Just uh, to give you an example, uh, attributive adjectives, for example, were used in both genres. Uh, but in uh, case studies, we could observe that they were helping the description of patients' issues or diseases in the medical area or products in the business area. Um, whereas in critiques, they are used more to evaluate previous studies or even to present um, theoretical concepts. Uh, stance features and hedging also were used, another example, in both genres but are um, very frequent in critiques to evaluate previous studies or one specific object of study. So in the article, all these usages were analyzed uh, in their context. So the readers will um, see the examples and will uh, have a better idea of how the features were actually used. Uh, so we hope to contrib contribute, we wanted uh, to contribute to understanding how the expression of different uh, communicative objectives is developed in academic writing through different genres. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daisy, for the interesting chapter and for uh, sharing with us your interesting work. Uh, I have the pleasure to invite Marini to the floor and talk about her chapter with Simone. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm very, very happy to be here with all these amazing people. And so I'm going to talk about the chapter Simone and I wrote for this book, which is called Investigating Brazilian English Learners' Use of Academic Collocations, a Corpus-Based Study. And our goal here was to analyze how Brazilian students produce collocations in academic texts written in English. And for that, we compare two corpora of unpublished texts, the, the famous Bo or Bawi, and the Brazilian version of it, Brawi. So here we are talking about two very similar corpora that make this kind of analysis possible. 
Um, in terms of methodology, we followed the principle of corpus linguistics. So we extracted the collocations from these two corpora with the sketch engine program. We established frequency and association measures criteria to decide whether the collocations would be part of the list to be later on analyzed. And then we started to observe if there were similarities, differences, or any other interesting behaviors that came up and that would potentially be nice to be discussed a little bit more. Um, something that is important to mention here is the fact that we extracted and analyzed three types of collocations with nouns as the main word. And this main word here is called the node of the collocation. So we had modifier plus a noun, noun plus a verb when this noun is the subject of this verb, and also verb plus a noun when the noun is the object of this verb. So um, we had these three types of collocations to consider. And this decision was based on previous studies that also organized the collocations um, this way. Considering the results and that we don't have much time and that we would really like people to read the chapter and download <laughs> the PDF version of the whole book, I'm going just to highlight some findings for you. Um, first of all, uh, the final list of collocations has 125 notes. And from these 125, 36 have similar frequencies in both corpora that we compared. So they are not statistically different, right? Uh, 48 are underused by Brazilian students, while 41 are overused by the in the Brazilian corpus. And based on these 125 nodes, almost 2,700 collocations were analyzed. And uh, this whole analysis shows us that the density of conventional combinations of words in the Brazilian corpus is lower, comparing to Bowie. And also the variety of collocations is kind of limited. And this can suggest that Brazilian students maybe prefer to repeat the same collocations over and over again, instead of maybe trying to use others that may have similar meanings. Um, at the end of the chapter, uh, as well as in the beginning, in the theoretical discussion, we reinforce the idea uh, of the importance of mastering collocations in order to write fluent texts. And also the idea that no matter your first language, academic language is always something to be learned. So considering the Brazilian context here, this is uh, also the case and it's not different. Uh, in terms of pedagogy, we conclude by saying that teachers and language instructors should focus on this language feature in class, especially when dealing with academic genres, because collocation is a very uh, important aspect of any language. And knowing how to use them properly can make a difference uh, to the quality of the text. And I guess overall, that's what I can share with you without giving uh, many spoilers. And of course, there are other results with more detailed descriptions, um, looking specifically at what modifiers and what verbs go together with the nouns, with the nou uh, nouns as a note but uh, this you can find out by reading the whole chapter. <laughs> so I guess that's it. And I thank you all very much. Thank you, Marini. Yes, it was uh, really fun to, to write this chapter mm -hmm. together. Uh, now uh, I'd like to invite Larissa Goulart. Hi, everyone. Um, so thanks first, Marini, Simone, and Rosani for inviting me and in the end inviting us uh, to write a chapter for this book. Um, I'm here representing my group of co-authors, right? So I also, um, the other authors in this chapter are Masha, who currently works at Duolingo and had a meeting right now, Kunakam, and Jennifer, who is a teacher at Community College, also could not come here to attend our book launch. But I wanted to talk a little bit about our chapter. So perhaps like a little bit differently from the other chapters, we were thinking in terms of as teachers of English and as corpus linguistics researchers, um, as, for example, Anna Bocorni mentioned in her chapter that she was trying to teach teachers how to use corpus linguistics tools. We were thinking that we also uh, were trying to use corpus linguistics tools in our own practice while also using that for using the same tools for our research. 
but we never it's hard for a teacher right to evaluate which corpus tool uh, which specially concordancer tool that's available online might be a better fit for their own uh, language teaching practice uh, we hear a lot about scale which is widely available we hear a lot about flex or just the word that speak and so on so what we tried to do in this paper was to create a coding framework and evaluate uh, the user experience, but also the research behind these tools uh, so that we can give teachers who uh, don't have the time to analyze the, the tools really a quick informed view of the tool and decide what's better for their own practice. So we evaluated five different tools, Flex, Scale, NetSpeak, um, I'm gonna have to cheat to take a look. Just the word uh, in lingo. And we looked into different criteria, like how easy it was for students to use, uh, what type of research background was there in these tools and so on. And then we evaluated them on a one to five scale, uh, the winners, in case anyone wants to know, but you have to read the whole paper, okay, to look at all the criteria. But the winners were actually scale and lingo. We also really like flex. And then in the end of the chapter, uh, we developed two different tasks of how these tools could be used for teacher uh, for teaching. So one of them is with flex and the other one is with uh, scale. And in the time of publication of the book, of course, things have to change, right? So flex is not available anymore as far as I know. Uh, so we will be, this is again an opportunity for those of you who are watching to complement this research perhaps adding new concordance or tools that are available online to the analysis. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Larissa, for the incredible paper you've written. I'd like to invite uh, Lucas, who is here to talk about the chapter he wrote with Laura and Simone. Thank you, Lucas. Hello, good evening, people. Thank you so much, Marini, Simone, and Rosani, for the invitation and for the opportunity of writing a chapter for this book. Uh, our chapter, as Rosani uh, has mentioned, uh, was written by Laura, me, Lucas, and Simone. Uh, it's very different, actually. We tackle the uh, concept of EMI, and the title of the chapter is Driving Forces to Adopt EMI which is also known as English as a medium of instruction. And the subtitle is Scholars Perceived Benefits of English Medium of Instruction in Brazilian Higher Education. So our uh, research uh, stems from uh, when I was like a junior researcher and then I was you know, helping Laura and Simone with all the data collection. And we were pretty much checking how uh, scholars and uh, professors at the university higher education level in Brazil. We tackled a really important matter when we think about, um, when we mainly think about uh, internationalization of higher education. So uh, we start discussing the importance of English as an international language, we discuss internationalization at home, and also how uh, these professors, PhD professors at the university level in Brazil, in all the types of uh, colleges and universities, public or private, how they adopt or how they do not adopt uh, EMI. So, uh, for this, we have gathered a lot of answers from like 5,119 uh, participants. And we tackled two questions here in this research, which is whether these professors have already uh, taught in English and the perceived benefits of teaching in English. And uh, pretty much in Brazil, this uh, EMI, uh, phenomena is still very incipient. So we do have like only 13.5% no, of the professors have already taught in English and 86.5 of them have never taught in English. So they mostly use like Portuguese. And in the second question that we asked them like the perceived benefits of 
teaching in English, they mainly point uh, the proficiency levels of the students getting better if they use English and also professors. And uh, the methodology we used to gather, to get all this data was uh, creating a questionnaire. We created this questionnaire and then we created codes for the answers and we analyzed open-ended questions too and also like yes or no questions to uh, quantify it. And it's really important to mention that in Brazil, this phenomenon is still very incipient and we are now working, Simone and I, to update this data and get more uh, valuable information about how English and other additional languages are being used in Brazil because it has been a while now since the last time we collected this data. It was like 2017 and then we we gathered the data and then we also uh, did like all the process of uh, looking at it and analyzing it but pretty much the perceived benefits which is the most important part of this chapter is that professors and students they have this opportunity to improve their english levels in the perception of these uh, professors that were contacted and also it's possible to invite more international students to participate in classes so uh, usually people think that we learn English just to go abroad and study internationally, but we also talk about internationalization at home and being able to provide an environment in which English is pretty much possible here in our country and in all levels of education. Mainly when we talk about uh, these different fields of knowledge uh, in the higher education level, so yes, pretty much, I think that's it. I want to thank you again. I want to thank again, Marini, Rosani, and Simone for this uh, opportunity of publishing this chapter. And yes, I guess that's it. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Lucas. So Lucas and I uh, go way back. And I think uh, he, you came to me through Larissa, right? <laughs> she introduced us. Yes, Larissa was my uh, teacher at the prep course for university, actually, 2014. And 2015, I entered the course and I was admitted to Letras. And yes, we have known each other for 10 years now, Larissa. <laughs> 10 yes, years. Says, Lucas and I go way back. I'm like, Lucas and I go way back. Yes, 2014. Back or, <laughs> yes. yes, I was 18 years old. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very good. So, like uh, uh, now, uh, yeah, looking uh, uh, and uh, considering the audience, would you have any questions, any comments, anything you'd like us to explain further? No. Just a little bit. Well, uh, since we, we don't have any questions, I'd like uh, to just to thank everyone for being here and, you know, for making it possible. And I think uh, it uh, really is a very good book with uh, chapters that uh, tackle on different aspects of English for academic purposes. And uh, well, I think it's worth the read. <laughs> and uh, uh, let's see if we have any questions. No? Okay, so thank you everyone and have 